So we've going, been going through a series called What Does the Bible Say About? And we've covered a number of different topics, what the Bible says about things like homosexuality, LGBTQ, what the Bible says about faith and hope and trust and things like that. And today we have another, I think, interesting topic. It's what do the Bible says about entertainment? I've never spoken on this topic, and so it was interesting for me to research it a little bit to see what does the Bible say about entertainment. But before I researched what the Bible says about entertainment, I was interested to see what, what is entertainment and what, how do people partake in entertainment in our world. And so if we talk about the entertainment industry, for instance, uh, the entertainment industry is worth a lot. Look at this. Two trillion dollars worldwide entertainment industry, industry, okay? I'm sure that all of you have some way or another spent money on entertainment, probably recently, probably within the last week, if not the last day. And of that two trillion dollars, 700 billion is just the U.S. So close, getting close to almost half of it, right? So that's, that's huge. Now, that's, those numbers are a little hard to think about, right? Like, I mean, I can think about a couple thousand dollars, but a few million, a few trillion, it's very difficult to think about. So to put it in context, the GDP, the gross domestic product of a few countries, right? So if you compare it to India, India's gross domestic product is three trillion, three trillion a year. So just a little bit more than the worldwide value of entertainment, right? That's how many people live in India? A billion or something, right? That's a lot of people, right? Uh, Canada, 1.8 trillion. That's less than the worldwide value of entertainment. Saudi Arabia, 686 billion. That is the amount of um, that just the U. That's less than the amount that the U.S. spends on entertainment, right? Uh, then we have, of course, Nigeria, 514 billion. That's our GDP. Uh, U.S. spends more than that yearly just on entertainment. Singapore, 374 billion. And Ukraine down there at the bottom. It's not at the bottom of the list. These are just a few countries I picked out, right? 164 billion. So to think of it, Ukraine's gross domestic product is 164 billion. The U.S. spends 700 billion just on entertainment every year. That's the value of it, right? So when we think about our society, our society worldwide really spends an enormous amount of money, energy, and time on entertainment. It is a huge part of the lives of people around the world, no matter what country you go to. Uh, some estimates that uh, Americans, actually I'm speaking Americans just because I could find the information on it, spend about four and a half hours a day consuming entertainment. That's like a good job, right? That's over 30 hours a week. Uh, so anything that we might be giving two, three, four hours a day to, we need to be thinking about, is it worth it? Am I doing something that is helpful or am I doing something that is destructive? Or should I be spending this time at all or this money on these things? And I think that if we were all to look at our daily lives, you know, if sometimes if I know some of you have iPhones, right? And you know what it tells me on Sundays? Do you guys know what it tells me? You spent this many hours a day or something like that. I'm like, I don't want to see that, you know. And in fact, I think Christina said she turned off that on her phone. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, because if someone was to actually follow your life and write down how much time you spent on entertainment, I'm pretty sure it would shock most of us. Because we usually underestimate how much time and energy uh, we give to entertainment on a daily, weekly, or monthly basis. But my point isn't really to give you, you know, make you feel guilty for spending a lot of time on entertainment, but really to help us look carefully on how we are spending this time, on whether or not it is something that is beneficial to us, on whether or not it is something that God wants us to be doing. And so, in order to do that, we need to look at what the Bible says about entertainment. And guess what? The Bible does talk about entertainment. And so, first of all, though, let's just define what we're talking about. What is entertainment? Entertainment, according to Wikipedia, is a form of activity that holds the attention or interest of an audience and gives pleasure or delight. 
So we can put a lot of things underneath that definition. Simply said, we can say that entertainment are things that delight us, but are not necessary for us. You know, it's not necessary. It's not work and things that we have to do, right? So we can put, obviously, movies and TV shows and YouTube and watching plays and things like that. We can put games. I think we can put sports under that, different hobbies, even music. Uh, for some people, food might be entertainment, right? They really enjoy uh, different kinds of food, things like that. So there's a lot of different things we can put under entertainment. But the point is this. Entertainment is, are those things in my life that I choose, like on my free time. I choose to partake in or, or to, to watch or to consume for my own pleasure. Okay, and we have to realize that some Christians hold extreme views on this. And so some Christians hold views that, oh, you know, Chris, a Christian should never partake in entertainment. That's, you know, that's evil. Uh, uh, Christianity should be serious. There should be no jokes. There should be no laughing. Everything should be serious. And, and this, these are serious things. And certainly there are serious things in the Bible. But I think that's an extreme view. Because when we look at the Bible, we will see some entertainment. But there's an opposite extreme, and that would be the extreme of saying, hey, life is about entertainment, right? And even some churches are kind of like this. Just Let's just make everything fun. Let's just make everything exciting. And we understand that that's also an extreme, and that's also not biblical. There are some very serious things and very serious times when we should not be partaking in entertainment and not seeking entertainment. So let's look at what the Bible says about entertainment. Uh, entertainment in the Bible. The first place that we see some sort of form, I guess you could say, of entertainment is in Genesis chapter 4, which is early on, right? This is the very beginning of the Bible where Moses is giving the genealogy of some of these early people. And we find this person in Genesis 4.21. It says his brother's name was Ju uh, Jubal. He was the father of all who played stringed instruments and pipes. So this obviously has to do with some form of entertainment. I don't think it was all just serious playing, you know. There's some form of entertainment happening here, usually when you have music. Some form of pleasure, some form of keeping people's interest, some type of a show or something like that. So it seems that this was important enough that God brought it out, even in Genesis chapter 4, that here's a guy this sort of invented, you know, things like the guitar and flutes and saxophones and other musical instruments. We don't really know anything else about this guy except that that's what he did, right? So we know that entertainment was there and God brought it out in the book of Genesis. But we also see that God really, I would say that he ordained or he told the Israelites to entertain themselves in a way. And that is through what? Through feasts, different feasts that they would have. The Israelites had eight different feasts that they did throughout the year. And it wasn't all just serious, like, church service, worship service type stuff. There was entertainment, I think, involved, especially in the Feast of Tabernacles. How many of you here, no, Feast of Tabernacles, we just had, I think, beginning of October, maybe, somewhere around there. So uh, it was just, or sometimes it's end of September, first week of October, Maybe it was at the end of September now. I can't remember. But did, you, did anyone notice the, the um, Jews that here in Odessa on the streets? They build these um, like tents. Anyone notice that? Okay, so next September, go down on Yvreiska Street, and you'll see that they build these sort of like outdoor, um, I don't know what do you call What do you call those things? There's a word for it. Yeah, it's like a tent, but it doesn't have a top on it. Because they weren't supposed to put tops on it so they could see the sky, right? Because they were supposed to sleep under the stars, right? And so for seven days, they were supposed to live in these little shelters. And here's, here's what it says, Leviticus 23, 40 and 41. It says, on the first day, you are to take branches from luxuriant trees, from palms, willows, and other leafy trees, and rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. Celebrate this as a festival to the Lord for seven days each year. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. Celebrate it in the seventh month. So this was a very large uh, feast, seven days long. And it says what? You're supposed to celebrate. 
So we can imagine that there was some entertaining going on. There was maybe some games being played. People were having fun. They were enjoying their time. They were being entertained, and God told them to be entertained. It was a very positive type of entertainment, right? Especially when God tells us to. It was a little bit like the, the, I guess we could say, feast that we had two weeks ago, right? And we enjoyed that time. There was some entertainment involved in that, although we were also praising God through it. Well, we see another form of entertainment in, in the Bible, and that is certain banquets that people had. And here we see some negative examples as well as some positive examples. And there's actually quite a lot of this feasting and banqueting in the Bible. But I could just bring out first a negative one, and then we'll look at a positive uh, one. And the negative one would be in Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar. It says in Daniel 5, verses 4 and 6, As they drank wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale and he was frightened with his leg, that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. Okay, why? Because God was judging him, right? This is not a good example of entertainment, of, of being drunk, of worshiping uh, false gods. They were worshiping the gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron and stone. And so Nebuchadnezzar's type of entertainment did not honor God. And he was judged for that. He was judged because he did not honor God. And really specifically here, even in his entertainment. We need to be careful as we think about our entertainment choices because whether we realize it or not, it's easy for our entertainment to turn into our idol. And today, many people worship the God of pleasure, the God of fame, the God of beauty, the God of money, all in the name of entertainment. Oh, I'm just entertaining myself. But you know what they're doing? They are really turning their desires, their heart, their attention, and their worship to false gods. Gods that will not be able to ultimately bring them contentment and, and lasting deep joy. Thankfully, we also see good examples of banquets in the Bible. And one of the best places to go to look, to look for banquets is the book of Esther. The book of Esther has eight banquets in it. And the first four are terrible, okay? The first four are really bad. They're bad examples. They're not honoring to God. And the last four are good. And those last four are really put on by Queen Esther herself. And those last four, in fact, they produce something good. Even through entertainment, Esther was able to save the lives of many people. Esther chapter 9, verse 20 and 20, 22 and 23 says... As the, as the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies, and as the month when the sorrow was turned into joy and their mourning into a day of celebration, he wrote them to observe the days as days of feasting and joy, and give presents of food to one another, and gifts to the poor. So the Jews agreed to continue the celebration they had begun doing what Mordecai had written to them. This was after Esther had saved the Jews from being annihilated by by um, by other people, and so they that is actually when the feast of Purim became uh, something in in Jewish Jewish history. So we see that was a very good thing. So we see that there is entertainment in the Bible. There's some bad forms of it. There's some good forms of it. But what about Jesus and entertainment? Is it kind of hard to imagine Jesus consuming entertainment, being entertained? What do you think? Do you think Jesus ever partook? In entertainment? I think that he did. I think that he did. It might seem strange to us a little bit, but let's remember in John chapter 2, it says, on the third day, a wedding took place in Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and, and Jesus was there, right? And his disciples were there. And so they all went to this wedding. What do you think they were doing at the wedding? Do you think Jesus was just sitting there like, not singing? not dancing, not being entertained. No, he wasn't. In fact, Jesus 
entertained because he turned the water to wine, right? And that's the definition we say, I'm entertaining someone, I'm, I'm, I'm feeding them, I'm, I'm doing things that are pleasant for them, right? I'm entertaining them, I'm keeping them interested. Jesus actually entertained the guest by turning the water to wine. And so we see that Jesus had you know, approved of some form of, of celebration that was honoring to God, some form of entertainment, some form of joy here. And then there's another interesting occasion when John the Baptist's disciples came to Jesus. In fact, this is interesting because it seems like even John the Baptist's disciples wondered about this. Why is he celebrating so much, right? Luke chapter 5, verses 33 and 34 says, They said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours go on eating and drinking. Jesus answered, Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? And so Jesus' answer was, Listen, this is a time for celebration. Let them enjoy the time while I am here with them. And we see that there is an appropriate time to celebrate. There is an appropriate time to be happy, to be joyful, to gain some sort of joy out of the things that we do. So these are just some of the examples of entertainment in the Bible and Jesus also and entertainment but I think that the Bible also gives us some specific instruction about entertainment that's important for us to look at. And probably one of the best places to go is the book of Ecclesiastes when we talk about entertainment. Remember, Ecclesiastes was written by King Solomon, the richest, the wealthiest, wisest king of Israel maybe of the world, right? And so you can imagine, let's imagine for a minute somebody like Bill Gates or Elon Musk or somebody who is very, very rich beyond what we can imagine, right? Jeff Bezos like, of Amazon, right? What do these guys do with their money? They build rockets and they like go to space, right? And you're like, how did, like, I thought only countries could do that. And now you have these individuals that are doing that. These guys are very, very rich, they basically can do anything they want with their money. And Solomon was kind of like that. Can you imagine if you had so much money, you actually couldn't spend it? You know what that does to people? It, it makes them pursue every single desire they have, especially if they don't have any limits on, on their heart and on their desire. They don't have any limits financially, so they pursue everything, every desire. And that's exactly what Solomon did. Look at Ecclesiastes. This is a little bit of a longer section, but I want to I read it for you because I think it's important. Ecclesiastes 2, 1 through 11, because here we see how Solomon pursued entertainment and pleasure and what happened. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees within them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired male and female singers and a harem as well, the delights of man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in my labor, and this was the reward for my toil. Yet... When I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless, a chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. Well, that's a good experience to learn from, isn't it? Isn't it amazing that God put this in the Bible 
so that we don't have to repeat these mistakes? Solomon tried it all so that you don't have to try it all, right? And what was his conclusion in the end? It's all meaningless, a chasing after the sun. He tried all the pleasures that you and I could think of. He said, I didn't deny my heart anything here. And what we need to take from this, really, first of all, is that our entertainment choices are really showing what is in our heart. Our entertainment choices are really about our heart. They indicate our heart's condition. What you choose to do in your free time indicates your heart's condition a lot more than your job or your studies or your profession. Because those are things you kind of have to do. Those are things that you have to do to live, to survive, to put food on the table because of your responsibilities to other people. But when you have free time, and you can use that time any way you want, and you're not limited, especially by finances, that, that shows the condition of your heart. And what is the problem here? The problem is that when we make entertainment the pursuit of our lives, we find that the pursuit of entertainment is never-ending and it is destructive to our souls. You see, the problem here is a heart problem. Entertainment per se is not the problem. The problem is the attitude of the heart towards that entertainment. And we need to be careful about this because when we pursue whatever it is, whatever hobby it is, whatever entertainment it is, whatever films that they are, whatever it is that we pursue, when we pursue it thinking that that will fulfill us and we push aside everything so that we can have that pleasure, in the end we will be disappointed. So we need to have some discipline in this. Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, verse 4, that in the end days there will be people who are treacherous, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. You see, that's the problem, isn't it? We love pleasure more than we love God. We think that entertainment and pleasure will give us what God is not giving us. And that's a lie that is not true. So we need to make sure that we understand and that we don't make entertainment the pursuit of our life. Okay? Make God the pursuit of your life, not entertainment. There's a second thing we see here, and as we go further down in this chapter in Ecclesiastes, uh, Solomon helps bring it out, and that is this. We need to give entertainment its proper place. And we need to make sure it's in the proper place in our life, both in the attitude of our heart as well as time-wise. So Ecclesiastes 2, 24 and 25, just a little bit further down, the same chapter that I read, it says, A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own, own toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God, for without Him, who can eat or find enjoyment? Do you see how he, what he did here? Now he puts God into the equation, right? Before it was just, hey, I'm just trying everything. I'm just going to pursue this, and I'm going to pursue that, and I'm going to see if this will give me pleasure, and I'm going to see if that will give me pleasure, and ah, in the end it didn't really work. And now he says, wait, wait, wait a minute. Let's stop for a second. Let's put God into this equation. Let's recognize God's place in my entertainment, in my pursuit of satisfaction, in my pursuit of pleasure. Let's recognize God's place. For without Him, who can eat and find enjoyment? And the answer is no one. You never eat without God providing it. And you never really have joy without God providing it. We just fail to recognize that sometimes. And so for the Christian, what we see here is something interesting. We see that we actually can be satisfied and that we can find joy, not just in entertainment, not just in those fun things we pursue, but also in our toil and in our work. And that is unique, I believe, to Christianity. The problem is that many of us work and pursue money just in, so that we can pursue something else, right? 
and we work five days a week or six days a week or however many days a week just so that we can have that one or two days a week when we can go and pursue something else. That's kind of not a very good way to spend your life, to tell you the truth. And Solomon tells us that we ought to find satisfaction both in our toil and in our entertainment. He says, this too I see is from God, right? So in order to put entertainment in its proper place, we must first have God in his proper place in our life. And then things will come into line. And what this really looks like is something called contentment. Paul also tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 and 9, he says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But we had food and clothing. We will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. You get that? You want to get rich? You want to just enjoy life? You want to just have an entertainment? It's going to end in destruction. Be content. That's where great wealth is. That's where great wealth is that no one can rob from you. No one can take from you because it is internal and it is given by God. I used to, uh, before we moved to Ukraine, uh, I used to paint for a living. I painted houses and outside, inside, and we lived in a uh, neighborhood, or actually we lived on the edge of a neighborhood that had a lot of expensive houses that were a million dollars, over a million dollars, and, and so they would hire me to paint their houses. And, you know, at first when I started doing that, I said, wow, look at this house, it's so amazing, it was these old Victorian craftsman-style houses, and, and, and it had doctors living in them, and lawyers living in them, and so it, my life would feel a little bit better if I lived in a house like this, you know? You just kind of get that feel. It would be, be nice, you know, at least, at least to try it. At least try living in a house like this for a month or, or 10 years. And, and, you know, but I started painting those houses, and you know what I realized? There's a lot of work that goes into those houses. There's a lot of money. There's a lot of time that goes into those houses. And it's not all just pleasure. And through that, you know what God taught me? You know, Caleb, be content with that little apartment that you're renting. Be content with that room that you're renting. Be content if you have a place to spend the night. Because maybe that's just the way God is keeping you from having all kinds of other troubles in your life. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have that big house. You know what? Uh, there are people that, that are able to have that, and that's given by God. But don't make that the pursuit of your life. Don't think that if I had that house or those clothes or that car, everything will be better in my life. But instead, if you do have that house, just thank God for it and be content. And if you don't have that house, thank God that you don't have that house, right? And be content. And so it's important that we are content and that changes our perspective on entertainment. It changes our heart attitude. And there's another thing here, and that is that as we look at our entertainment, we want to make sure that our entertainment is pure. And here, Paul talks about this in Philippians chapter 4, where he talks about our minds. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And so we can simply ask, does, is that describing our entertainment or not? Is this verse describing the thoughts that are in our entertainment or not? Unfortunately, we live in an evil world. There's a lot of evil around us. Some of the evil we can't avoid is just around us, right? We're going to see it. We're going to hear it because it's maybe it's part, of, it's part of, it's our coworkers or it's our neighbors or somebody nearby. So why should a Christian choose to enjoy something that's evil? That's only going to be destructive to our souls, isn't it? And so let's ask ourselves, is our entertainment full of violence, coarse language, 
Is it sexually explicit? Does it promote that which is against God? Does it make fun of things that are good and praiseworthy and approved by God? Is it disrespectful and dis demeaning to others? We need to think about these things. And if we say yes to any of those things, then we probably should get that entertainment out of our lives. There's plenty of good and wholesome and, and God-honoring forms of entertainment out there that we don't need to pollute our mind with things that are not that. And, of course, the list can go on. But what we need to do is we need to stop and we need to clean up our phones and our computers and our minds and our hearts so that our entertainment honors God and that will be a blessing for us. Again, what does Paul say? Titus 2.12, he says that it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. That is unusual. That is unusual. It's not something that's easy, but it's something that we can do as Christians. But we have to consciously make that decision and carefully analyze those choices that we're making in our entertainment. We need to have pure entertainment. There's another thing that I see here, and that is that our entertainment should be regulated. Sometimes even good forms of entertainment, when we spend too much time on them, can become a bad thing for us, right? Again, we can go back to the book of Ecclesiastes here. Solomon tells us in Ecclesiastes 3, Verses 1 and 4, he says, There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. So we need to ask ourselves, am I giving the proper amount of time and in the proper place to my entertainment? Because the truth is we can't go about feasting every day, can we? That's not healthy. It's good when we do it on occasion for a good reason, at a good time. But we need, to comp we need to think about these things and contemplate the really the shortness of life, right? How much do I really want to give to my entertainment? And here's another verse in Ecclesiastes that I like. It's Ecclesiastes 7, verses 2 and verse 4. It says, It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of everyone. The living should take heart. The heart of the wise will be in the house of the morning, but the heart of the fools will be in the house of pleasure. Let me ask you, where is your heart living? Is it constantly living in the house of pleasure? It shouldn't be. I've had an opportunity to preach sermons at weddings and at funerals. And let me ask you, where do you think people are listening more intently? At weddings or at funerals? At funerals. There have been occasions when I preached, in fact, a number of years ago when my, my sister's husband was killed in Iraq. And that Sunday, um, they asked me to preach that Sunday. And, and he was a young man and had a wife, a, a little boy. And the whole church was really just shocked by it. And I can't, I've never heard people so, I didn't hear people being attentive because there was not a sound in the audience as I preached, except for the sound of some sobbing. And, and people listened. They listened to every single word. Of course, it's a little different at a wedding, right? They're like, oh, good, he's going to preach. I hope it's not too long. Let's get to the good part, right? <laughs> you know? I mean, yeah, maybe they listened to something, but it's like, oh, look at that dress. Oh, look at the flowers. Oh, oh look at those little girls. Look at that little girl. Look at that little boy, you know? And the truth is that we need to spend serious time in serious places in our heart. And so we shouldn't be constantly looking to entertain ourselves. God made certain things for our enjoyment. And he takes joy when we take joy in those things. But he wants us also to be serious. So we need to regulate our entertainment and... We also need to make sure, oh, oh sorry, one other thing here uh, in regulating our entertainment, and that is we need to prioritize our work over our entertainment, okay? Uh, 
Very simply, Proverbs 6, 6 through 8, go to the ant, you sluggard. I mean, he's really straightforward, isn't he? Just go to the ant, consider his ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer, yet it stores its provisions in the summer and gathers its food and harvest, okay? Do your homework first, okay? Do your homework before you play games. Do your homework before you go on Instagram, okay? I'm saying that to all the students, right? I'm saying that to my kids, too. Um, or, or I can say to myself, write your sermon first, right? Write your sermon before you go and go to the gym and work out. Or whatever your work is, do your work first before you enjoy your entertainment. So, prioritize your entertainment. And then, finally, I think it's important that we acknowledge that God is the source of all true entertainment and joy and pleasure. So, when you find entertainment that pleases God and it's in its proper place, you know what? You can know for sure that that entertainment is coming from God himself. All good things come from God, James says, right? Or how about this, Psalm 104, we read the last uh, part of Psalm 104, but here's a verse that says, Psalm 104, 14 and 15, He makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for people to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth, wine that gladdens human hearts, oil to make their face shine, and bread that sustains their hearts. You see, God is talking about a lot more than just sort of God gives you the basic necessities of life. God gives us even what should make us glad and joyful and even entertain us. And God takes pleasure to see that we take pleasure in the things that he gives us. And there is an appropriate time and place for those things. He gave us food. He gave us the beauty of nature. He gave us ears for music. He gave us eyes for art. He gave us bodies and appetites. He gave us sexual intimacy. He gave us all of these things, but they have their time and their place. And we should not abuse that. And we should not use them in a way that God did not mean for them to be used. So as we think about some of these things that we see in Scripture, I want to give you three principles to evaluate entertainment in your life. And I've alliterated them just to make them a little easier, and that is time, type, and treasure. Can you remember that? Time, type, and treasure. Just remember those three things, time, type, and treasure. Time. How much time am I giving my entertainment? Do I limit my time? Do I discipline my time? Do I do my work first? Is my entertainment time Commitment keeping me from making other commitments that I should be making? How much time am I giving to my entertainment? Type. What type of entertainment am I enjoying? Is it pure? Is it noble? Is it healthy? Is it holy? Is it, or is it vile and corrupt and wicked and hateful? What type of entertainment am I enjoying? And finally, treasure. What is my heart's attitude towards my entertainment? Am I expecting that this entertainment is finally going to make me content and bring me ultimate joy, or am I treasuring God above my entertainment? Can I be content if that form of entertainment is taken from my life? Am I seeking my joy in that entertainment, or am I seeking my joy in God? Where is my treasure? Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And we need to realize that ultimately, entertainment is a heart issue. It is an issue of the attitude of our heart. And unless God is the treasure of our heart, we are always going to be searching for that joy, for that pleasure, for that desire outside of God. But we're not going to find it. Because entertainment is an idol. It is a lesser God if we make it that. But find God, make him your treasure, and God will give you the joy of your heart as well. He will give you pleasures, and he will give you joy and entertainment as well. Amen? Amen. All right, friends, we want to take some time to pray. We haven't prayed in groups for a while, so I want to, let's do that today.